And I'm Andrew Hone, President and CEO of the Portland Business Alliance. Thank you for joining us today for our COVID-19 Recovery Roundtable with Metro Council President Lynn Peterson, who's in the virtual house. Uh, while we can't, of course, be here together in person, we are thrilled that we can continue to be a resource for our community hosting events such as this. And a huge thanks to many of our members on this call today who have answered the call to help support our community in countless ways. And as I've mentioned before on any one of these uh, roundtable series, uh, that the Portland Business Alliance continues to be here for all of you, our members. Uh, we have set up a page that is a, a resource-focused uh, COVID-19 page. Please visit portlandalliance.com forward slash COVID-19. Follow us on social media for updates, and you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and elsewhere at PDX underscore Alliance. Uh, just a few engagement details, little rules of the road for all of you who are joining us either for the first time or need a refresher. A recording of this presentation links for all the resources mentioned by Metro President and her team will be available shortly after we wrap up so you can just keep an eye on our site. Uh, during the presentation, if you have questions for the speaker, please use the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen so you'll note there's the chat function which we really encourage you folks to engage in, but if you wanna ask a question, Make sure to use the Q&A uh, function. And what happens is our team here at the Alliance puts together questions and hands them to me and I'll be able to answer those once we've moved through the presentation by Metro President Peterson and through some questions we have uh, at the beginning. So uh, make sure to include your name, your company location, website, and anything else you want us to know about you. So this morning we are looking, excuse me, morning, it's afternoon. We are looking at the Metro region's response to the COVID-19 outbreak impacts from the economic downturn and what plans Metro has in place to help us recover and rebuild. Please join me in welcoming our Metro Council President, uh, Lynn Peterson, to our COVID recovery uh, roundtables. Welcome, Metro President. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me, Andrew. Absolutely. So with that, really the show, the floor, if we had one, is yours. So we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. We'll bring up a quick presentation and uh, I'll walk us through a little bit of what we've been up to. Great. Tee up the presentation, I suppose, right? Yep. There we go. Okay, awesome. Um, again, thanks for having me here today. Uh, first, I want to thank everyone who is on today for all of the work that they have put in for helping the region be as resilient as we possibly can and finding creative solutions um, and being part of the solution for our region. It really um, is, is mind blowing how you have stepped up and, and tried to help uh, others while we are all uh, suffering as we go through this pandemic in terms of uh, both loss of family and friends, but also uh, economic uh, loss. So one of the things I think we just need to recognize that nobody could have prepared for this, uh, whether it was uh, your business or a government, because no one had the scenario in their uh, economic plan closed for a pandemic for weeks or months on end. So um, I, I think we all need to appreciate that uh, we are all doing the best that we can with what we've been given. I also want to acknowledge that a lot of you are not just going through a lot of business hardship, but a lot of personal uh, uh, hardship as well. I know it's hitting our family and uh, it's hitting families all across this region and your sacrifices are meaningful. They really are. The fact that we have the lowest rate of infection and the lowest uh, deaths in the country per uh, it is really an amazing achievement and I just want to thank everybody for all of the work that you've put into making that happen and the sacrifices. So thank you. Next. I just want to give a, a quick overview just to remind you of what Metro does. Uh, we are everything but a public health agency. Uh, so we are part and parcel of a lot of the work that you do at PBA in terms of uh, travel and tourism and uh, that is our venues side of the equation. So we run, uh, own, operate, maintain the convention center and the expo center and the Oregon Zoo. And then on behalf of the city of Portland, we also have the Portland Center for the Performing Arts P5. So 
Uh, those were, and we'll talk about this, the hardest hit. We also have the parks and nature program. We have the regional park system in the region. We do the land use and transportation planning for the region for the long term. And then uh, garbage and recycling, the waste stream. We manage that and that's the largest part of our budget in terms of uh, where does revenue come from from Metro. Next. The immediate uh, the immediacy of the impact of the pandemic was, uh, it, you've got the airport picture here, but the airport picture is really what the convention center looks like, minus um, our uh, folks that we opened up to for the homeless shelter distancing um, work that they're doing there. But essentially it's vacant, right? 95% of the air traffic is down and we are uh, closed for the last six weeks. We, we, we were probably, when the state went down into a lockdown on March 12th, we um, were immediately shut down uh, even before that because our conferences and um, uh, folks had decided to not hold their conferences because people didn't want to come. So we were on a, uh, a week, week and a half of seeing things slowly shut down, but then we obviously shut our doors. Um, that is a major impact to the entire region. It has uh, 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 major waves that, that then go through the rest of the region. Uh, in 2018, the last year we have data available, Metro's visitor venues attracted 3.8 million visitors and they spent $756 million in the Portland region on re restaurants and hotels, on gifts for their families, on splurges on our sales-free uh, state, uh, sales tax-free state, and also on the things it takes to run an event or put on a concert, the event kits, the catering, the displays, and yes, the Metro staff that run those events. And this was supposed to be an amazingly good year for all of us because of the opening of the Hyatt Regency Portland Hotel at the Convention Center and the OCC's multi-million dollar renovation was completed. And I hope before we shut down, you all got to see the amazing renovation work that went on. It is uh, so ready to be used um, as soon as we can. And it's heartbreaking that we had to lay off uh, over 700 folks that were skilled and dedicated uh, to the mission of OCC and the Expo and uh, the Oregon Zoo and the performing arts. So um, we're, we felt that pain almost immediately and have been working to uh, make sure that, that those staff are taken care of as much as we can um, while they were laid off. Um, and we're working very hard to make sure that we're ready to be online when, when we are ready to be open as a state and a region. Next. So what does re regional recovery look like uh, for us? Um, our region economy has been really through hell and back several times. Um, so we know that we are resilient because we do things differently here and we support our small businesses, our thoughtful growth and preparing for the future uh, to help recover so that everybody will benefit. Perhaps the region's greatest strength is its support for its small businesses when you start to think about what, um, the, you've got the big business names, but the folks, you know, when people are coming here, uh, they are just as much going to um, all the small businesses in the region as they are uh, happy to be uh, in, in, in a place that's headquartered uh, by such an amazing amount of um, outdoor tourism-based uh, economy. Metro's 2040 plan was focused on commercial and retail growth in the centers and corridors to support those small dis business districts in the downtowns and the regions of the 24 cities. Our small businesses keep money in the region and support an overall uh, stronger economy. Of course, we also support our economic growth partners in bolstering the emerging and proven industries that ensure our region supports entrepreneurship and innovation and can support our traded sector industry growth. Next. What we're looking at uh, is using, as we come out of this Metro's ability to create a plan. Um, I think a lot of you uh, know the 2040 growth concept plan, but uh, it is now uh, 20 years into that 2040 plan and we were ready to update it to 2070. That is on hold. We are gonna be uh, not talking about a 50 year plan at this point. It's too important to focus on how to make sure that we recover and create a stronger, more resilient region on the other side of this. So we're looking at partnering with GPI 
uh, to make sure that uh, we can have a five-year plan and it's an action plan, uh, very focused on what can we achieve in the short run, the medium, and the long term of five years, not on 50. Uh, we'll come back to the 50-year plan when that seems like the right thing to do, but right now it seemed better to focus on the immediacy of this economic crisis. And when we do, we really want to make sure that we have an equitable recovery. Our construction careers pathway program that's focused on apprenticeship and uh, getting folks trained up, whether it's internship or apprenticeships, uh, to be able to grow the trades as we come out of this is going to be um, a key to this economic recovery plan. The work that we've put in with all of our uh, public agencies to be able to use the capital money that we have that's uh, I believe over four billion dollars over the next 10 years in capital projects is focused on achieving uh, results of growing our workforce, growing the diversity of that workforce, and making sure that uh, we are getting as many of our local folks ready to have family wage jobs. So that's a, a big uh, part of where we're headed as, as an agency. Next. So thanks to the voters, when we do that capital construction, we do have the affordable housing bond measure, which is 652.8 million, 600 million for capital investments. Uh, the housing authorities are, are getting that out onto the street now. We've approved 330 units of the 3,900 units that we said we would build over the next five to seven years. Um, and that's one of the key mistakes that we had in the Great Recession was that all housing construction stopped, but we're gonna continue to keep going. Uh, because of the investment and support uh, of PBA in passing the affordable housing bond measure. So thank you. Next. Uh, the other uh, big item that we have that uh, has proven to uh, not just be good for being able to move products and people in the region, but also to making sure that we can have good paying jobs as we move out of this recession is the Get Moving 2020 transportation package. As many of you remember, it was pretty easy to move around the region in the last uh, in the Great Recession, um, but that didn't, that's not necessarily a good thing, right? It's actually a sign of economic um, loss when we are not moving around the region. And uh, polling just six months ago, people were saying homelessness and transportation were their two top issues because the uh, congestion had gotten so, uh, so bad <laughs> um, that uh, people were willing to uh, uh, have that conversation. And what we know is that this, this is gonna be part of our economic recovery plan of getting people back to work uh, and making sure that we can move people when, when we come out of this uh, economic situation we find ourselves in. This is the map of the 16 corridors that we are looking to spend $4 billion in uh, the next 10 to 15 years when we put this out to the ballot for this November. We have every uh, intention of putting it out to the ballot for this November. We will probably wait to refer it so we know exactly where the voters are and what they're uh, interested in hearing. Um, and you know, if we need to make a few tweaks, we can, but we will also be looking at how we potentially uh, phase in taxing so that we recognize the situation that we're already in. But these are project ready, um, shovel ready rather, and they will also be uh, projects that we can access federal money from. This package in total with the programs that we've outlined and I've talked to in the past is about a $5 billion project. Uh, program that would leverage two and a quarter billion from the feds, state, and local governments. So it's about seven and a quarter billion dollars worth of investment in ourselves, which is really important at this point. That uh, would leverage about 37 to 57,000 jobs for the future um, over that 10 to 15 year build out. So that's where I would just end the presentation, say that's where Metro has uh, been focusing time and energy is basically working on our internal issues like everybody else to stabilize and now uh, letting the public health folks do what they need to, to do, supporting them, um, and then moving into recovery. Thank you.
Thank you, Lynn. Um, it's a great presentation, good synopsis of what Metro is, does, and where we are right now. And I, I want to move into some questions for you. So, um, and just a reminder to the folks that are on the call to make sure to submit your questions to the Q&A piece uh, so that we can get those directly to the president. So I think the first one is, is always an interesting th thing to hear how different leaders are managing uh, how the economic crisis hits their budgets in particular. And there's no secret to anybody here on this call, any business uh, that's out there for the most part uh, are facing budget cuts and staff reductions. Uh, and we know Metro, just like any other organization, our region has been hit uh, particularly hard. You mentioned this during the crisis in particular around the convention business. You recently laid off 40% of your staff and I know that cannot be an easy process. So why don't you start by sharing with us how Metro is budgeting and approaching the upcoming current crisis as well as the upcoming severe financial crisis and why Metro was so hard hit versus maybe some other governments on a more immediate basis. I think that's a key piece here. And yeah, then yeah. walk us through what's the future look like for getting back uh, to full strength. Oh, thanks. The, I think the, the place to start is that most of our public partners um, are property tax based. Metro is really not property tax based except for the uh, ballot measures such as the uh, parks regional the open space fund measures. Uh, so we have only about $16 million a year generated from property taxes and property taxes, um, just like the Great Recession, didn't see a, a, a huge a decrease. Um, so we don't expect to see any loss of uh, revenue from the property tax, but it's a very tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of our overall budget. The 70% plus of our budget is in the waste stream um, and managing the, the waste stream. And that's where most of our general fund money comes from. Uh, we did start to see a decrease in the waste stream prior to uh, the pandemic even hitting. And there has been a slight decrease since then. While residential uh, waste stream does seem to be going up because people have been cleaning their garages and basements having been home, um, that is not a significant portion of the waste stream. Um, so uh, that, that, that brings us back down to why we were so hard hit is the, is the revenue generated from the venues um, pays for those venues. There's, there's very little subsidization of those venues from our general fund. So when the revenue coming in from those conventions uh, being canceled, that was immediate and there, there's no backup. So um, I wanna move into a question I know is actually relevant for someone's already asked a question. And I know we're also joined um, on this call by Jeff Miller. Uh, Jeff, I hope you're doing well. Hope everyone at Travel is doing well. Uh, and this is actually building on what you just mentioned. Uh, so we're beginning to talk about how the state and county plan to reopen at the same point in the near future. And I'm sure the teams at Metro are thinking about what you just talked about, these venues in particular. Tell us how you are planning to adjust business operations for your revenue generators that have had to close. So venues like the zoo, the performing arts, and in particular, I know Royce's Prop Shop is uh, asking about the convention center's plans to reopen and stay open while we're still working to slow and minimize the spread of the coronavirus. It's that balancing act that I think we're asking about. So thanks for the question from Royce's Prop Shop. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know, each one of our venues is completely different and each one will have its own opening schedule depending on uh, what, what and when we are allowed to do things. But the, I think the good news is that the Oregon Zoo, because it's outside, will be able to open a lot sooner. Uh, we will, uh, we're looking at ways to uh, even have a reservation system because we'll have to control the number of people that are actually inside the zoo at any one time. And I, I know like you, I don't think it's a good idea to have a bunch of families lined up at six foot intervals waiting to get in. I think that's probably not what anybody would want. Um, but we do know that that is a big part of uh, being a Portlander in, in, uh, the, in the summer, especially, is being able to get into the zoo. Uh, whether we have concerts or not, that is that is open question for the future. Again, to when, when can you have more than 10 people, 20 people, 100, 250 people? I don't think we have an answer for that in terms of a date. I think that the triggers that the state has laid out, when do we have enough testing? When can we do tracing? When do we have a vaccine? All of those things are gonna come into play 
as we go to the larger venues. And I think that we um, are certainly looking at options, uh, but being able to get to those large meetings and conferences, is, it's gonna take some time. And I don't think we, I think we're all very aware um, in the entire industry of what it's gonna take to be able to have those large conferences and have people feel safe, right? It's a perception as well as a, the reality. Well, I think um, Jeff's comments really say that, uh, sum up what you're, you're, you're pointing at really succinctly, which everyone's eager to get on that road to recovery when it is safe. And I know that both of my young boys would be thrilled to get back to the zoo right now, but we're going to stay home, obviously, to be supportive. Ah, baby giraffe. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so we know, uh, next question, we know that Metro has taken a lot of actions to support the community and businesses during this crisis. Uh, and, and you're the regional agency, and that's the key element here, is you're a regional agency. And I think some of those efforts haven't necessarily received as much attention as the big state actions or what are historic national actions by those governments. But why don't you share a couple things uh, that come to mind for you on how Metro supporting uh, the community needs right now and maybe some business needs as well. Sure. I, I thank you. It, it is an interesting position to be in. Uh, this is not a normal natural disaster. And Metro has been part and parcel of the Regional Disaster Preparedness Organization, uh, basically planning for the Cascadia event. And if the Cascadia event happened, Metro not only has mapping tools and the ability to help get information out and be a helpful communicator, uh, but we also would have to deal with the waste stream. Right, so we have backup plans uh, after backup plans of what if there is a major Cascadia event and when we start to uh, rebuild our communities, what do you do with the, the waste? Somebody's fallen down fireplace, like in Olympia, all the fireplaces came down when they had their, their, um, their events. Uh, a lot of concrete what had to be torn out and put back, right? A lot of homes had to be restored. There's a lot of waste that's created out of all of that. And so we have backup plans for that, but that is not what we're facing. Um, so we really worked with the RDPO to uh, do information sharing around uh, the PPE, but also to get information out in a consistent manner uh, to the community because the public health folks were dealing with the public health emergency. Uh, cities and counties and uh, our other partners uh, needed a, a a way to get consistent information. So we've been helping RDPO do that, as well as how to manage all of our facilities. And you, uh, people are aware, I've mentioned it, we, um, again, we're not the public health agency, but when asked by Multnomah County, could we have social distancing homeless shelter inside the convention center, we said, yes, definitely, let's do that. We're not using it for anything else right now. Um, we also made, when OHSU asked us for, uh, can we use the expo parking lot to do testing, we said yes. So we've been a, a partner that way uh, and, and have tried to make sure that the different hospitals and different health arenas know what facilities we have and what their, uh, their capabilities are and what their capabilities are not. Um, and I think that's really important so they don't go running around trying to find a site for a use that, um, be, would be a waste of their time, especially when they're moving so quickly. Um, so we also didn't want to get in the way of any of the public health emergency messaging, right? So Metro has just been there to support all of that and be a megaphone when, we, when they needed us to get the message out further. Um, we are obviously still moving forward on our capital bond programs. So in, in doing so, we continue the construction side of this economy. Uh, we are part and parcel of that with our, our bond measures that are out there and we will continue to push those out the door so that we can keep people uh, employed. I was, um, Washington State was way harder hit and when they had to shut down construction, my heart just went out to them because that was the last thing that was actually moving in the economy up there. And you know, to have several billion dollars of transportation projects just by the state and by Puget Sound put on hold um, and it's a huge, a huge issue up there that we have not had to face and hopefully we can continue to keep people safe and moving forward there. So I'm excited about those types of uh, work. Uh, we also are looking at changing our sponsorship program. The council has a sponsorship program where we 
uh, sponsor the PBA gala, gala, right? And we buy a table. Well, there are no galas. Um, so we are looking at changing up that sponsorship program to very to be much more focused on uh, the needs of our community today in terms of food stability and uh, uh, folks trying to, that, that need help finding employment, uh, those types of things, and then moving to a bigger program through our budgeting process. Because we, we again, we don't have money that we can move as quickly as the city of Portland or uh, the state. So we are looking at our next budget cycle to create a community partnerships program that's much larger than the $34,000 in the council sponsors budget. But we really wanted to focus on making sure that people are fed and housed out of the little bit of money that we have. You know, you make a really good point about the difference um, literally just up the river between Washington and Oregon where we've had manufacturing construction continue. You can literally cross the river and you can see a total difference of how the economy is moving uh, versus here where you see active construction sites and yet uh, you go just north of Columbia and it's it's a totally different story. And I think it's a testament to the fact that we've had uh, less of an outbreak here and yet still had the ability to keep the economy humming. So hopefully that means we're mitigating the worst of the impacts, economically speaking. It's a good call out on that. Um, yep. I, workers pulled over on I-5 for coming down here trying to find a job. There you go. Um, interesting times we're living in for sure. And, and really that tees up, I think the next question, and I wanna uh, give a little bit of a shout out to our partners at uh, Greater Portland Inc. We've got a number of you on the, the call today. I see Brittany's joined us from the team over at GPI. And we've got some great board members, both between the Alliance and GPI. I see Michelle Weisenbach's with us, Randy Miller. Michelle uh, is with KeyBank, Randy Miller with Produce Row, and of course, he's just a ubiquitous human out there. So, and a lot of other supporters of both organizations who appreciate all the work that GPI does to convene regional roundtables, of which is part and parcel of what Metro's core functions are. And, and into the question, uh, knowing that your core function is to develop a coordinated long-term regional plan in significant areas of, of, like you outlined, growth, transportation, parks, and beyond, you announced last week at the Greater Portland Inc. Board uh, meeting, uh, which I was uh, happy to be a part of, that you'll be leading a regional team to develop a comprehensive economic development strategy. And I, and I think it's important to, to make sure to define what that is for folks, because not everybody is aware of what a SEDS is when we're getting into federal acronym territory. So uh, first and foremost, what is a SEDS? Um, and I'm very pleased to be, of course, a, a participant in that. And I just was, was grateful to be invited. Why don't you share with us how this effort is going to look different now than it was originally planned for and how Metro and GPI are gonna to work together to think about long-term economic recovery as part of this SEDS process. So the um, SEDS stands for the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy, which is a requirement of the feds and GPI has been a partner in doing that update uh, with us as kind of a co-sponsor in the background. Uh, several times, and it is really an action-oriented uh, plan. Uh, it needs to be done in, in a coordinated way with, um, with the regional land use and transportation planning. So uh, we, we have obviously, like I said, thought uh, long and hard about moving away from the 2070, 50 year, um, what is the right time to start looking at our 50 year plan again and really want to put more, more resources and more time and effort into uh, the said strategy. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to be moving forward with that uh, and, and make sure that we're not duplicating any work across the region because resources will be so limited over the next year, year and a half um, that that's really where we need to focus. So the, the number one thing for Metro and our core function though, is that we get our tourism industry back up and running, right? That, we, we talked a little bit about that just now, but I just wanna make it very clear. There are so many small businesses that are uh, part and parcel of that ecosystem that are hurting right now that we, we are focused on that as part of our core mission. But then we have an obligation that's bigger and broader than that for the recovery effort. Um, and we, we really believe that uh, working through GPI will give us the biggest bang for our buck in terms of the partners that are at the table and then who we bring in to uh, really help uh, make that a more uh, full conversation about 
what, what does economic recovery look like? What are the action items that need to be done? And then how, how do we actually achieve that? So I think we, we will be uh, very excited about that five-year five -year focus instead of a 50-year focus. Yeah, the idea of thinking 50 years ahead is <laughs> certainly a challenge right now. So if you can think 50 minutes out, uh, kudos to anyone on this call. Uh, yeah. So uh, I want to move into an important conversation because I think part of, of looking into the future and, and one thing that we certainly uh, don't need a crystal ball for is that when you have an economic downturn, uh, folks are struggling to make ends meet. Uh, they can't, uh, you know, make a a rent payment or whatever else, and, and we're likely to see a major increase in homelessness and, street, and the unsheltered population, street homelessness in particular. And uh, the Portland Business Alliance is a member of the Here Together Coalition, which worked with Metro to develop the Homeless Service Initiative that is going to be on the May ballots. Folks should start to see those ballots drop into their mailboxes shortly. Uh, the Alliance endorsed this measure along with well, more than 60 other organizations and, and nearly 400 businesses at this point. And we know that you are working hard on the campaign to get the measure passed. So why don't you give everyone here that's listening, what, what's the update on the campaign? How is it going? And do you see any major shifts in support for the measure with the current crisis? Uh, and then sort of lastly, if this measure passes, talk us through the implementation phase of this. So three, three parts, if you can keep those straight. First of all, the latest polling that the campaign released last week uh, showed that we were certainly still, the region certainly still saw this as a major issue that they wanted to help resolve. Um, so the polling showed that it, we were at 57% of folks saying they agree or strongly agree to moving forward with this even in the midst because they do see the, the need before and now they understand that the need is going to be even greater. Um, I think what, what we also know is that uh, there are opponents and those opponents are out there and they're now on the airwaves and they have put out not just misleading information but actually completely inaccurate and uh, false information um, and that they are saying that this is a sales tax on groceries and pharmaceuticals, which means that people could potentially think that this is going to increase their costs on food during a pandemic. So uh, what I would say is let people know what it actually is, which is a, a personal income tax and a business income tax on those who can afford it the most. Um, and it's above 125,000 for a single individual. It's on the marginal rate and uh, to 100,000 for the um, uh, joint filing and about 5 million for a business and profit. So th those, are, those are big numbers. And uh, it, just to remind everybody, that means that 90% of all individuals in the region will not be taxed and 94% of all businesses in the region will not be taxed. Uh, and I, just as a follow-up question, I just note this, that's uh, coming from Will Rasmussen. Will, who's a partner over at Miller & Ash, just First off, uh, thank you, Will, for your membership. He's also on our board, and he chairs the Government Relations Executive Committee, which runs the endorsement process. And he had a really straightforward question. So Will wants to know, what, what can businesses do to help with the campaign moving forward if they're, if they're interested? Yeah, I, now more than ever, uh, any, any way that you can get the information of the Here Together campaign out uh, to any email list that you have, to any of your friends and let them know that you're supporting it, um, that PBA supports it, that there are 400 plus organizations that support it, that would be very helpful. Um, and I know that these are really hard times, but I can't ever uh, let an opportunity go by to just say the campaign can always use more uh, money to make sure that our positive messaging is out there because we know if the positive messaging gets out there, uh, then people are 100% supportive if they know the facts. And so thank you Will, for that question. The third part of your question, Andrew, was uh, what's next when it passes? Uh, we will do exactly what we did with the um, affordable housing bond measure. We will be creating an oversight committee at Metro per the, the way this was set up. 
The counties will also be setting up their own committees, uh, oversight committees, because they will then be creating county plans that will be done in conjunction with Metro uh, to meet goals that will be established by, by the committees. Um, and then we will come together, and I think that uh, there, that's the key is we're, why would they, everybody want to go to the regional level is to make sure that as we implement, we are implementing towards the greater goals of the region as well as the individual counties um, so that we, we can make the biggest difference and just make things consistent on the implementation side. So if you're in that state and you're coming off the streets, you don't want a whole bunch of different bureaucracies uh, coming at you. We want, we want consistency and ease of use. So I think that's what we'll be looking for. Uh, but the first thing is to get those county plans done and intergovernmental agreements in place and then, and then start working to get those services out on the street as soon as possible. Great, thank you for remembering all those layers of questions. So much appreciated and thanks again, Will. Uh, so let's pivot a little bit towards another major initiative. You had mentioned this at the beginning of your, uh, your, your remarks about transportation. And let, let's look into the fall, which I know again, everything is hard to do at this point. Everything is just, we're writing new scripts as we speak. Uh, you led this, this effort, a painstaking effort for multi, multi Tudes of stakeholders were involved in a public process to develop a regional transportation infrastructure me measure. And, uh, you know, thanks to Dave Robertson, who's uh, our most recent past chair who participated on that, but BGE was an active participant on that. I see Pam Trees uh, as well, good colleagues, and Jessica Baker Peterson were, were co chairing that. So um, this is on track to be referred to voters in the fall. Now, with the status of that process and given everything that has happened in the last month or two, uh, get, just dial a little, little bit more into the, what you were saying around the detailed plans that are referring the measure this fall and, and what, what criteria will you use to make that decision? And you mentioned phasing in taxes, if that's a possibility. Walk us through all the, the traps that you're considering right now. Yeah, I think the, the confusion of, and, and anxiety out in the general public right now is, is understandable and I think we'll be looking for uh, not a reopening kind of consistency, but we'll be looking for people uh, to feel secure, um, a little bit more secure about what is going to happen in the future. Um, and I, I think it's important that we recognize that people feel that anxiety, but we, we know that now more than ever, this transportation measure is needed. Uh, because during, like we said, during the Great Recession, we obviously didn't have a whole lot of congestion, but the minute we came out of it and everybody went back to work, we had severe congestion. So we need to make sure that two things happen. One, that we are moving forward with something that gets people back to work as soon as possible. And second, that we invest in ourselves. And I've talked about this ad nauseum. I'll just remind everybody, we have not had major transportation investment in this region for four decades. We have done a really good job building out a light rail system and making sure that those corridors are working. They didn't work for everybody and we had gentrification occur. What we're learning is that as we make investments in these corridors, we need to make them multimodally. We need to be sure that we have a racial equity lens when we do it and we need to make sure that we're not displacing people from those corridors. So it is a comprehensive package to deal with the issues that we have going on right now. I want to thank PBA for all of the work over the last 18 months as part of that 35 member task force. Uh, the, the business members that have been there have been a huge help um, in, in giving perspective of what is necessary to achieve both a business as well as a, um, a multimodal transportation system. And really focusing on the safety, really focusing on how do we move people, how do we move freight, not just how do we move cars, because if it's just about how we move cars, we're never gonna succeed. Uh, we can never keep up with that. So we really, uh, really, really appreciate bringing those perspectives to the table and figuring out how to make those corridors work for all modes um, from the entire length. And as the map showed, some of those corridors are pretty long. TV Highway from stem to stern from Forest Grove all the way into Beaverton, Burnside from Beaverton all the way into Gresham. Now, if that's not a regional package, I don't know what it is. 
because that really lays the foundation for being able to move across the Willamette River and north-south within our region. Um, and the types of improvements in those corridors really echo what we're seeing happen across the entire country when regions start to invest in themselves and not just rely on the state uh, money as well as the state system, which is the interstate. If we're just relying on the interstate system, we don't actually start to move people around our region. We're just moving them through. So uh, when you look at Seattle, when you look at Los, Los Angeles, when you look at Denver, they, um, they have all really been able to use this not only as a way to increase mobility, to improve safety, uh, in, increase the uh, affordability, but also to uh, make sure that they are a viable economic engine for the future. So uh, let me just reemphasize re the number of jobs that we expect uh, whether it's a conservative estimate or slightly less conservative, over the 10 to 15 years of build out, we expect to see 37 to 57,000 jobs, direct and indirect, being created by this package. So it, it again, it, it serves two purposes. One, we're gonna come out of this, we're gonna all get back to work. We need a system that works, but we also need to get a whole bunch of our folks back to work in jobs that are family wage jobs as quickly as possible. And if you don't mind, I'd just love to ask a, a follow up on this on the infrastructure piece. I think, you know, there's our congressional delegation. We have the chair of transportation and Congress member DeFazio, which is a great uh, a win for the state to have that sort of leadership in the House. What are you hearing about, you know, from a congressional act or you know, a stimulus 4.0, 5.0, 6.0? Talk us through a little bit about the, the initial things you're hearing on whether or not there'll be federal intervention. That was a just as a refresher for everybody, it seems like a lifetime ago, 2008, 2009, infrastructure shovel ready transportation projects were key priorities in the stimulus packages coming out of that Congress. What are you hearing and what do you expect? And, and most importantly, what can we in the business community do to work with you to advocate for those dollars to come back to the Portland region? Um, you know, I think what I'm hearing, what a lot of us are hearing is that there's a desire to have a infrastructure package, um, but not a time certain and maybe not um, complete agreement on how to get to that. What is it? Does it look like ARA or is it what uh, our esteemed congressman has um, already put together as the next iteration of the transportation six-year bill? So I think, I think there, uh, there's gonna have to be a lot more conversation to figure that out because um, I, I think that, and that's, that's okay to take a little bit more time on that because there's infrastructure and transportation and there's infrastructure like broadband that we need. And this pandemic has shown how much more we need to invest in stuff like broadband uh, to the rural area as well as our own um, cities so that we can accommodate more people working from home because that was not something that uh, we had planned on two months ago was to have this many people working from home, uh, but it's going to continue into the future. Now that we have broken that barrier, I would see the expectations of businesses changing of how many do they house internally all at the same time in office space. How do they utilize that differently? How do they allow for flexible work schedules to be working from home as well? Because people have been productive. So um, I think that that is, uh, an interesting take on it. Now getting back to the um, question at hand, uh, we I think are going to make sure that we uh, poll folks in May, June, and July. Uh, the last day to refer this to the ballot would be August 15th. And I think that my goal in my head is no later than August 1st, but I do wanna give us as much time as we possibly can to understand where the public is and where our partners are. And if there's anything we need to tweak within the package to get it going as quickly as possible for the things that we need now versus what we thought was the most immediate um, with the pand before the pandemic. Great, I know um, our friends over at the Frog Ferry, I see you Susan uh, on this call. I know you'll be watching, so appreciate everything you've done to put that system together. What a great, great project and a good member of the Alliance. Thank you for your, your membership. Uh, so moving on to sort of last sort of question for you really uh, is we're, we're headed into a, what is going to be a recession and certainly a downturn uh, and we're going to be facing a long-term economic recovery effort. So for all of us in the business community, what can we do 
to partner with you specifically uh, and Metro to help with the long-term recovery and in the way that you would see us being most useful for you. Um, thank you. I think uh, we appreciate the partnership uh, that Portland Business Alliance has provided and really want to continue that. I think the, what, the single most important thing that I think a lot of leaders in this region would agree with is that the way we did business prior to uh, COVID can't continue because the inequities in our society were growing too large. The homeless service measure is certainly a um, indicator of that. So how do we start to focus in and be mindful of equity as we move into the future? The study after study of major metropolitan areas shows that when folks have um, the ability to succeed in life with basic health and uh, a good paying job and affordable transport and affordable housing, then uh, you set the conditions for great economic conditions. And I think that we, um, because we've done so well in the pandemic, it's just another indication that we can minimize um, negative impacts by working together as a region to reduce uh, those negative impacts. So uh, it may not seem obvious, but our career, our construction career pathway program that we talked about um, is really one of those key things that we would love to see the private uh, industry start thinking about how do they weigh in on the same initiative. So when they're doing large construction projects, what are their goals on equity? What are their goals on diversification of the workforce as well as um, being able to grow folks into those careers. Uh, we would love to have uh, folks think about um, just what, what can they do to help bring in more folks that have not had those opportunities before. We've got a lot of communities in this region, black and brown, that have not had the opportunities and we have not focused on their issues. So when we did that on the transportation package and we said, where are those communities? Are they isolated? In other words, have we created isolation as part of our transportation system because we haven't actually provided them the access they need to jobs, education, and uh, healthcare? Right? That is a fundamental thing that we need to make sure that we're doing as a region. But as companies, I think we can do an even better job figuring out how, how do we, coming out of this, close that gap together. And we'd love to be a partner with you on that. Thanks for that comment. And, and actually, we just have another question that came in. And I think this is a really good one. It goes back, and then I think we'll be able to wrap this up. But um, I'm seeing, again, our, our colleague Jeff over Travel trying to ask for the crystal ball on federal uh, stimulus conversations. We just saw Congress and Trump sign into uh, law additional resources for PPP and for the small business relief loans. And then this question goes back to what about financial help on a federal level for venues? And I think that's a really good question. It's not just about venues, but I think there's so many ancillary businesses that depend on the operations of things like the convention center whether that be the events business or others. So uh, anything you're hearing from a federal level on support for venues in the upcoming next round of stimulus uh, conversations? Well, it's certainly been something, obviously, that we've been working very hard with our federal delegation is to remind them um, that while it's a public health crisis, Metro was hit hard uh, on the venues and all of the ripple effects that that had throughout the region uh, I think that they uh, that had not been, I don't think, very high on their radar, and it is now, which I appreciate. Uh, we have been working hard to get uh, clarification on a lot of things because this, all of this legislation just went so fast. Um, it, so we actually have uh, an application on behalf of Metro for the venues uh, to the feds now. Uh, we don't know, we have no indication of, of where that will go or how that will fare. Um, but we'll, we'll see. Um, but really that's about um, startup, being able to start up as quickly as possible again, because uh, it doesn't cover the loss of revenue. So uh, 
I, I don't have a crystal eight ball, but what I know is that we are all working together and we are all very focused on making sure that the venues conversation is part and parcel. I, I think that um, the, the advocates for the zoo <laughs> um, are also out there making that because that's a, a, a separate and distinct different venue that has a real um, issue to it and that we are taking care of a lot of souls at that zoo. And there are, there's a very small workforce right now uh, being able to, to do that. So it's not like you can just close a zoo. Um, so we, we are definitely hurting there. And I would say that that's uh, another part, part of our venue's portfolio that we are working hard to make sure that people understand what it takes to keep the zoo just at operation, not, not for anybody being there, but just basic operations. Well, I think that's a sort of a good way to wrap this all up. And, and I think to you, President Peterson, also to all of our members, uh, thank you for being on this call. Thanks for your uh, insights into how F Metro's been impacted by this and how you're moving towards reopening. Uh, we wish you and especially your team uh, just the, the best wishes and, and thank you for all the partnership and, and what you're doing for our region. So thank you, President Peterson, for this presentation today and being available for all of our members. Thank you and know that we'll be there uh, to help with the recovery. That's great to hear. And for all of you who are on the call, make sure to join us tomorrow. We're having our first election Q&A webinar with candidates who are running for Portland commissioner uh, for uh, seat number two. Uh, you can make sure to register at our website to, to be there and go check that out at portlandalliance.com. Uh, and to everyone on this call, stay home, stay healthy, and uh, looking forward to the conversation tomorrow. Thank you all.